Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman here in our Northwest Side studio. All right, we'll come back to Paris shots in a minute. On the show tonight, Chicago's newly elected police union president. A visit to the DeSable Museum of African American History. Bookshelves running dry. Local bibliophiles share their picks. The history of the Chicago common brick and a dandy to some, pests to others. A look at the dandelion's reputation. Hey, Brandis, I'm plugged in now. Sorry I missed you there in the beginning. I'm reporting live tonight from Kankakee, about 60 miles south of Chicago. We spoke with some farmers here. We spoke with local officials who believe that this area should reopen much quicker than Chicago. So we'll have all of that and more in just a bit. But first, we toss it back to you for the latest developments from today. Thanks, Paris. A judge will decide next week whether children in foster care can resume having in-person supervised visits with their families. The Department of Children and Family Services halted the practice in late March to ensure the health and safety of the children and families and has instructed staff to hold those meetings, those visits via phone or video call. But Cook County Public Defender Amy Campanelli is challenging that temporary ban on behalf of four mothers whose visits have been suspended, arguing that preventing those visits is harmful to the relationship between the children and their families. Both sides expect the judge's ruling on Monday, and you can read more about the arguments in this case on our website. As first reported today by WTTW News, the Adler Planetarium lays off 120 of its full-time and part-time employees. According to the source who alerted us, Adler's donor grants have dropped as much as 50%. The source fears the planetarium's research will suffer as a result of the cuts. An Adler spokesperson told WTTW News the layoffs affected all departments and that employees will get 60 more days of pay and benefits through the end of July. You can head to our website for more on this story. Illinois can't rush to reopen and it can't let differences divide us. That was the message from the governor and the state health director at their daily briefing. As voices pushing Governor Pritzker to lift some coronavirus restrictions grow louder, Dr. Ngazi Azike warns the illness doesn't care about your race, region, or political party. Let's not let this virus succeed in dividing our families, our communities, or our state. Let's keep working together to end this pandemic. The way we respond to this virus today will affect our lives for the generations to come. Zika also announced 138 new deaths for a total of 3,928 and more than 3,200 new cases for a total just under 88,000. Pritzker says that county sheriffs who don't enforce the stay-at-home order will face consequences and warns against municipalities moving ahead with their own reopening plans. The governor is facing, though, political pressure from some downstate areas to reopen faster than Chicago and Cook County, given lower rates of COVID-19. Paris Schutz and our team traveled down to Kankakee, about 60 miles south of the city. Local officials there have taken issue with the fact that the governor has grouped it in the same region as Chicago as part of his reopen Illinois timeline. Paris now joins us again from inside the majestic building in downtown Kankakee. Paris. Yeah, Branch is a beautiful old restored building here in downtown Kankakee. And as you mentioned, uh, the local officials say that this area should be treated differently than Chicago and Cook County. Now, Kankakee is the seat of Kankakee County. The entire county is reporting 874 positive COVID-19 cases. And now, if you look at the demographic makeup here in town, there's a population of about 26,000, about evenly split between African-American and Caucasian. Local health officials say they have not seen the explosion in cases that we've seen in Chicago and across Cook County, and they say that hospital capacity is okay. And if you look at the surrounding region, towns like Mantino, Bradley, Bourbonnais, the bulk of the cases are coming from long-term care facilities, veterans' homes, nursing homes, rehabilitation centers. And there's an outbreak of 116 cases and one death reported at the Shapiro Developmental Center in Kankakee. It's a site run by the Illinois Department of Human Services. Now, a spokesperson for that agency says the first case was reported there on March 25th. They say all family members of all cases have been immediately notified. They say that Shapiro and all other state-run facilities 
instituted safety and social distancing protocols two weeks before they ever saw a case. Now, since then, they've deployed the Illinois National Guard and hospital staff to Shapiro to mitigate the situation. They do say it is far better under control than it was several weeks ago. One of those hospitals is St. Mary's Amida Health Center. It performs about 60 COVID cases, tests per day, and it says it has no more than eight to 10 COVID inpatients on any given day. And it has a cool rite of passage here when a patient recovers, the entire staff gets together with the Rocky theme music playing and cheers the patient on as they are discharged from the hospital. Now, Amita is a really large health system across the state, which means it can take patients from other hard hit areas like Chicago. And the hospital CEO says treatment has really improved as doctors and staff now have a better idea of how to treat this illness. On the front end, there was a lot of unknowns and so uh, and a lot of different mixed information. And so now our physicians have a much greater confidence. So even a physician today who was responsible for one of the discharges we had that from a COVID positive patient um, was just expressing his, his personal confidence in um, responding immediately um, and being able to uh, kind of track the symptoms and understand how to respond such that their hospitalization was much, much shorter than the original patients we had. As far as the town's economy, it had been struggling before, and now the sidewalks are pretty empty here downtown. We did run into one boutique clothing store called Evolve, and the owner there had a really novel idea. She evolved her store into selling clothes through social media. So every day, she does an Instagram live stream showing off her products. We go live for about an hour and show off our newest inventory that we have in for the week. Um, that way we're able to still, again, connect with our customers virtually. Um, so I could be talking and people are throwing in questions and comments and at least we're able to have a dialogue that way. So we process their orders all through social media, send them an invoice, and a couple days later we're seeing them at our curbside pickup. In Paris, there's quite a lot of rural area between Chicago and Kankakee. You spoke with some local farmers. How are Illinois farmers faring? We did meet a few farmers. We met Illinois farmers uh, Greg St. Aubin and his son-in-law, Brendan Supernant. They operate in the north end of Kankakee County in Mantino. And farmers are being hit just like any other industry. Now, food may be in high demand, but there are a few problems. One, commodity prices for corn and soybeans have tanked which means St. Aubin has to sell his yield for much, much less. Now compound that with the hit that farmers took from the trade war with China, plus plunging oil prices, which affects ethanol, and it's a perfect storm of financial difficulty for farmers. It affects the bottom line very seriously. Uh, you know, us in the agriculture industry, you know, I mean, that's our total source of how we operate our business is through selling of our commodities. Uh, you know, we. We produce our commodities only once a year uh, compared to other industries that are making widgets or whatever every day. Uh, so uh, the obvious uh, situation of us having to depend solely on markets, world events, pandemic, to try and move the markets where we can sell our commodity at a decent price and make a living. And then there's problems with livestock. So as you know, so many meat packing plants across the nation have had outbreaks of COVID-19 that have caused them to shut down. That means livestock farmers are facing an excess of animals that can't be sold. Producers are not able to get rid of their animals when it's time to go to market. For, because of uh, the pandemic, a lot of these meat packing plants have shut down so they have barns or feedlots full of animals ready to go to market that have nowhere to go. Uh, and unfortunately, because of animals that are growing or in younger stages of life need to take their spot. So unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of producers that have nowhere to go with, with their finished product. And we'll be back in a bit with some public officials that believe that this area should open far earlier than Chicago. And now, Brandis, we toss it back to you. Yeah, Paris, it's so unfortunate that that is the case for those farmers when at the same time there are people who need food. So tough spot. Thank you. And now to Phil Ponce and Chicago police officers, new union leader, Phil. 
Brandis, Chicago's police union voted in a new leader last week, but this isn't the first time the new president has made the news. John Catanzara has been on the force for the past 25 years and has been the subject of 50 misconduct allegations. His unfiltered social media posts have put him under investigation from the city's police watchdog agency. However, Catanzara won the fraternal order of police's runoff against the incumbent, Kevin Graham, with 55% of the vote. And joining us now is John Catanzara. Catanzara, the new FOP president. Mr. Catanzara, thank you for joining us. And first of all, why do you think you won? I think the members want a voice. They are a forgotten voice. They are unfortunately battered repeatedly in the media, uh, unappreciated at City Hall for the most part. Three years without a contract, pretty much you couldn't highlight it any more than that. There, there's various reasons. So, uh, of the reasons you mentioned, is one of them the most pressing item on your agenda? Correct. Which one would that be? The contract. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were referring to the contract. <laughs> and uh, you're coming on three years without a contract, and uh, the FOP has voted to put their demand, at least last December, for an 18% pay raise uh, over three years in the hands of an independent arbitrator. What is the status of negotiations? What's going on? Well, we are still obviously have our demand for arbitration. However, we did uh, notify the city that our request for a specific arbitrator was being rescinded. I had had a meeting already on Monday with the lead negotiator for the city, Ms. Jackson, and we had a very lengthy uh, hour plus conversation, which was very cordial, productive. And the, the decision is to go back to negotiating and postpone arbitration as long as possible. Huh. And. Uh... Let's segue to a related subject, and that is, uh, what are your thoughts on the consent decree and compliance with it? Well, I was never a fan of the consent decree uh, from day one. Compliance with it is very simple. Judge Dow has been absolutely rock solid that anything that is contractual will not be forced upon my members going forward. It will have to be negotiated by the city, and that is in large part, or in some part, why there has been delays because the city has tried to circumvent negotiations by forcing policies on the members that ended up at the labor board for unfair labor practices only to be basically dismissed and said go back to negotiating so it's kind of been a big merry-go-round in that way as we mentioned in the introduction you have a uh, you have a controversial past, I think it's probably fair to say. Uh, you are, according to various reports, among the most frequently disciplined officers in the department. Let's look at uh, a real quick look at your history. There have been 50 misconduct allegations against you. Ten have been sus uh, sustained. You've been suspended for 30 days for harassing an ex-girlfriend, six days for associating with a felon off-duty, 10 days for insubordination, 15 for personnel violations, 20 for being AWOL in 2012, there was a dismissal attempt. The allegation was you were working a second job while on medical leave. Instead, you were suspended for 20. And in 2017, you were reprimanded for a Facebook picture uh, in uniform with a political poster. What do, you, uh, what do you say to folks who are concerned about your credibility to represent people who are involved in law enforcement, given your own disciplinary record? Well... I'm not necessarily too concerned with many people's opinions. The only opinions that matter are the members, realistically, and they spoke pretty loudly. My team had 27 uh, spots available, and we won 17 of them, so uh, 18, actually. I think that speaks pretty volumes that our message was heard. The members want a new direction, and that's what we're going to give them. In terms of the public perception, though, of the, uh, of the FOP, uh, does your personal background speak? Uh, is it possible that it could uh, hurt the public perspe uh, uh, perspective on the FOP itself, though? Well, I think, sure, it could. However, you know, certain, I won't even dignify his name by speaking it, but certain uh, reporters in this city, even though they claim to be not anti-police, couldn't be more. And the simple fact is, I don't like addressing this. I'm not going to address it a lot, but it's a personal matter. Everybody likes to highlight the domestic as if I'm some domestic monster. It was not a domestic violence battery case. The simple fact is it was someone I cared about very deeply, was dating for an extended period of time, 
who developed a very serious addiction problem to alcohol and painkillers. Uh, I was trying everything I could to rectify that situation and turn it around. Uh, it didn't work. The simple fact is, several years later, she passed away from an overdose. So everybody can judge on the book cover, but read the whole book before you do. Uh, it, it's really easy to just sit there and read a discipline case and say, you know what happened. You didn't live it. I did. Well, let's talk about your current status, because uh, my understanding is that you are currently relieved of your police powers and are under investigation because of a report you filed against former Superintendent Johnson, accusing him of breaking the law by allowing protesters on the Dan Ryan. What is the status of that investigation? Well, actually, I actually had a meeting earlier this afternoon with the super, or actually this morning with the superintendent at 35th in Michigan. It came up in conversation along with some other topics, but the status is what it is. Uh, it, it's still undecided. You know, I've asked repeatedly the status of superintendent, former superintendent Johnson's uh, retirement star and identification, because there's a very simple policy within the police department. If he received his credentials when he left, and that means the complaint against him was closed out. It piggybacks onto the complaint against me for the reports against him. So theoretically, it should be closed out on my end too, but that's what they're holding my star and ID for. I think it's ridiculous. I explained that to Superintendent Brown. He vowed to look into it amongst other things as far as this is an ongoing problem. It's been rampant in the police department for obviously uh, retaliation for certain bosses there's been policemen who have been stripped of their police powers for extended period of time. And trust me, I feel their pain. I've been through it before. It needs to change. And hopefully with Superintendent Brown's cooperation, we can kind of come together with a new roadmap to how, how to make this sure that that doesn't happen. Just one more question about your personal background, uh, Mr. Catanzara. Uh, according to the Tribune, you have posted inflammatory material about women, welfare recipients, and those who agree with your politics. Is that true? Everybody's entitled to their opinion. I, I don't agree with that assessment, but other people seem to think we look that way. You know, this department, there's laws in this state and specific to this department about sworn affidavits. You cannot just make anonymous complaints. But yet, COPA took a complaint from Reston, Virginia. Think about that dynamic. Because some guy, a keyboard warrior from Reston, Virginia, was offended by some of the things I posted on Facebook and my opinions. He compiled a long list of stuff together, mailed a copy to COPA, who took after David through the mail to get a complaint against a Chicago police officer. They think that's a fair discipline process. Again, it's ridiculous. And this isn't just, this isn't just, I don't want it to be about just me. Clearly, I've had my discipline issues. I've picked a lot of fights willingly because I cannot stand the hypocrisy within the police department. The same people who want to call out my discipline record have done nothing about the example after example that I have provided in public forums, in City Hall, at the police board about exempt rank members' behavior, and they've done nothing to investigate them like it doesn't even exist. I find that pretty curious. Uh, in the past, you've been fairly confrontational with Mayor Lightfoot. Uh, what is your posture going to be in your new position? How would you describe it? Well, optimistic. I, I think, if anything, the meeting with Ms. Jackson on Monday was a pretty good signal that dialogue is available and possible. Uh, today with Superintendent Brown, again, people like to paint me in a box and think they know who I am and what I'm about and they couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, the simple fact is you highlighted some of my police board cases. The rec most recent one for working secondary employment at a restaurant wasn't necessarily the truth as described, but the, in that case, I represented myself at the police board. I was my own attorney and I'm still here. So I know how to present a case rationally and argument it rationally. And that's what I'm presenting to my members going forward, a voice that's not afraid to speak out that knows how to articulate a point with a little authority to get some things done. I'm not going to back down from anybody. I know what I'm talking about, and I know how to get things done. Failure is not an option. John Catanzaro, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Phil. Have a good night.
And up next, Paris shuts and the mayor of Kankakee on the community's COVID-19 response. But first, a look at the weather. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, the next stop on our series of virtual visits with a look at the DuSable Museum of African American History. How are local bookshops and libraries holding up? Plus, suggestions for your next read during quarantine. Jeffrey Bear on the not-so-common brick that built Chicago. And can the dandelion ever be seen as more than just a weed? A look at the plant's role as a pollinator. But first, we check back in with Paris Schutz, who's co-anchoring tonight from Kankakee, about 60 miles south of Chicago. Paris. Yeah, Brandis, and now we're joined by Kankakee's Mayor Chastity Wells Armstrong. And Mayor, thank you so much for being here. As we mentioned earlier, you know, hospitals here don't seem to be too concerned about an outbreak of cases. They, they feel like the capacity is okay. So what are the things that keep you up at night as mayor about this pandemic and this shutdown? Um, first of all, public safety, uh, making sure that, that people um, have their basic needs. Food has been an issue um, of concern for many people, so we are currently partnered with our local Jewel and Burkott's grocery stores doing a food drive, and we're going to give all of those um, donations to our anti-poverty agency, KCCSI. So for context, how big is uh, a problem is food insecurity right now in Kankakee? Um, we have a number of low-income families. We are a CDBG community, so I don't have a, a number, but it is a significant issue in our community. And, and so what is CDBG community? Community stand? Development Block Grant, so it's for lower-income families. Um, and so I want to make sure that everyone has a meal. I've, we've been working with our schools as well to make sure the kids have meals while they've been home. And we've partnered with them as well to make sure that they have cleaning supplies and those types of things while we're enduring this pandemic. Okay, so what about the local economy here and uh, businesses? How are they doing and uh, how many are gonna be able to make it back? People are very stressed, needless to say, when you're talking about a loss of income. Um, businesses that weren't deemed essential have been very stressed. And so um, we were able to secure some federal funding and inc increase to our allocation from the federal government for our CDBG funding. And we are getting ready to launch what's called a bounce back Kankakee program. And that program will provide rental, utility, and inventory assistance to our business owners and also rent and utility assistance for residents. So can all of your businesses apply to receive Absolutely. that? Absolutely, yes. We are putting together an application right now and getting that loaded onto our, our website, and we should be able to launch in the next couple of weeks. Now, we're gonna talk about this uh, a little more in a minute, but uh, you know, the governor has lumped Kankakee and Grundy County in with Chicago in terms of the reopening. Do you think Kankakee should be able to reopen restaurants and uh, other uh, establishments before Chicago? Because it might be a while in Chicago. I don't think that we have the amount of impact as Chicago does. We obviously are not as populated. Um, I don't know that we should open at full capacity for our restaurants, but I would like to see us um, removed from the same classification as Chicago because we do look differently here. We also have two hospitals, which most communities our size do not have that type of um, access to medical resources in the community. So from what I'm understanding from our medical professionals here locally, we are in a good uh, space and, um, right now with the pandemic and can accommodate um, cases as we get them and provide the care that's needed. So when do you think is the earliest uh, that restaurants could open on a limited basis here? I can't here? give you a date on that. Uh, and, and what else would you like to see from state and, and federal officials? I mean, you got a budget you're gonna have to put together pretty soon. Right now, I would like to see us start to reopen by the end of the month. We are currently under a shelter in place order through May 30th. So I would like to see some restrictions lessened by June 1st, that's the first thing. The second thing, um, our state municipal leagues across the country have partnered with the National League of Cities. They represent villages, towns, and cities all across America for what's called a Cities Are Essential campaign. We are lobbying Congress very heavily right now for $500 billion for over the next two years and direct aid to municipalities. Some of the previous packages um, were restricted to populations of 500,000 or more. 
Kankakee County at the last census had about 110,000 residents, so we were well under that threshold. This would allow us to get money directly to the city of Kankakee to help us supplement the losses we've had in our budget. All right, Mayor Chastity Wells Armstrong, thank you so much for joining. Best thank of you, luck Paris. and stay healthy. All right, Brandis, we'll have more on why local officials want the governor to consider letting Kankakee and Grundy County open earlier. But now we go back to you. Yeah, Paris, it sounds like, you know, she's making the case that it is it is not the health problem that has struck them so hard as much as it is the economic crisis that's hitting them. Thanks. We'll see you soon. Up next, we stop at the DuSable Museum of African American History for a virtual visit. Chicago tonight is made possible in part by Allstate. Allstate is investing in Chicago's youth. We believe good starts young. That's why we're helping our youth develop the skills they need to achieve success in life. Allstate is proud to empower the next generation of leaders. Next year marks 60 years since the founding of a Chicago institution that has a connection to the Smithsonian. The DuSable Museum of African American History was founded in the living room of Margaret Burroughs Bronzeville home and then moved later to a Park District building in 1973. It's shut down right now, museums being deemed non-essential, but the staff shared their very essential collection with Chicago Tonight. Arts producer Mark Vitale has that story. The DuSable Museum explores an incredible range of history. From the Middle Passage, to the ongoing struggle for civil rights, and into the 21st century. It has the good, the bad, and the ugly. The collection contains rare artifacts. This is the writing desk of Ida B. Wells, who just last week won the Pulitzer Prize for Courageous Journalism. It was a rare posthumous Pulitzer. Wells died in 1931. And the DuSable has artwork by and inspired by its founder, Margaret Burroughs. We're really looking at telling the story of black America, of the history of America, which we are, you know, part and parcel of the cloth and the fabric. You can't pull away the black thread and still have America. We are really the oldest independent black museum in the nation and have been a Smithsonian Institution affiliate since the spring of 2016. The DuSable closed in March, soon after opening a show called The March. We have been closed to the public since March 14th, uh, so very trying times for us. We had staff layoffs that were just unavoidable. But it's an interesting time for us, right, in terms of having just opened the march, which of course is commemorating the 1963 March on Washington for jobs and freedom. And to now be in the midst of this pandemic, that is having a deleterious effect on the African-American community, a disproportionate effect. It's really kind of bringing to light the reasons for the march in the first place. Elsewhere in the museum, there are stories of the 370th Infantry in World War I. The decorated unit from Illinois fought with the French because the U.S. Army was segregated and then faced race riots when they returned home from the war in 1919. The collection also has important objects from the Black Power movement that emerged 50 years later. Sadly, the DuSable's animatronic likeness of Mayor Harold Washington was offline during our visit. Chicago, my city, I love you. That's founder Margaret Burroughs in a WTTW interview six months before her death. On our website, you can see her read this short love poem to her hometown. There are no professions, no industries uh, in this city where black pioneers and, and business people weren't paramount to the success of the city. And we really want to tell those stories and share those stories because many of them um, have been not forgotten by, by us, but have never been you know, fully explored and presented to the population at large. So we like to tell those stories and present them in a way for everyone to learn because this isn't just a place for black people to come and learn about our history, it's for everyone. And when you think about the benefits that the folks today and young people especially would have in knowing that full and correct and accurate history, what a better place we'd be in, right? 
For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. The DuSable Museum is in the process of updating its website to share more of their deep collection. And as we mentioned, you can see Margaret Burroughs read a love poem to Chicago on our website. It is worth a look. And now we check back in with Paris Schutz, who is co-anchoring tonight from Kankakee, Illinois. Paris, I understand you're joined now by the area's state senator. We are joined by the area state senator. He is a Democrat named Patrick Joyce, and his district stretches from the south suburbs of Chicago down through Grundy and Kankakee counties. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. All right, so as you know, the governor has divided the state into regions in terms of who can open earlier. Kankakee and Grundy County were put into the northeast region with Chicago. Why do you want it removed from that region? Well, when the map first came out and the five-phase program that the governor brought out uh, had Kankakee and Grundy in it, I received a lot of phone calls from Kankakee and from Grundy County asking why. And at the time, um, the, the positivity rate, which is one of the governor's criteria, uh, they were a lot lower in Kankakee and Grundy, and they felt like they would be able to open into phase three sooner if they weren't linked with Chicago. So with that many constituents calling my office, I felt that uh, I needed to write the letter. Well, you said at the time, is it still the case that the positivity rate I think rate Chicago's is numbers are coming down. I think all of Region 1 is getting close to uh, meeting the criteria that the governor laid out for Phase 3. Well, he did. He did say that it is meeting right. the criteria for Phase 3. Which so, is great. Are you, so are you saying you still would like Kankakee and... Grundy counties to have restaurants open sooner than perhaps in Chicago? Not, not sooner. I, I, I think that we wanted to go along with the governor's program. I was just concerned about where the line was drawn. It's even better if all of Region 1 meets the governor's criteria and we all open up at the end of the month. So you're, it seems like you're saying right now, because the numbers are improving in Chicago, you might, you might not need to have Kankakee removed from, from that region. If that's the case, yes. But I just want to make sure that they are afforded every opportunity in Kankakee and Grundy um, if Chicago's numbers were to change and, and they weren't a, to change in those two communities, I'd like to, for them to be able to move into phase three and stay there. Now, if, if you were to move into phase three or four or five earlier, is there concern that opening it up could, could see cases rise again? Always, always. The, the, the medical community and the health departments need to be driving this bus. I mean, you have to go by their guidance. And the governor's criteria, it's a, it's a well laid out plan to reopen Illinois. I just was concerned that a, a, a larger population like Chicago could take these communities and slow their, their reopening. Okay, so you're uh, gonna meet with your colleagues in the House and the Senate next week to work on a budget. You told me you think you might have a budget passed by the deadline at the end of May. What's that gonna look like? Well, it, and, it, and it's something that this, the Senate and the House, we've been working this whole time in, in smaller working groups and it's not our normal working situation, but uh, we've always been diligent about moving forward with working groups. Um, uh, and through Zoom, uh, we're all Zoom experts now, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's going to be challenging. Well, th if the budget gap is like four, five, six, seven billion dollars, how do you plan to close that? Well, there's a, there's a lot of different ways. I mean, some are going to be cuts, some are going to be uh, federal assistance, um, but it, it's going to be a, uh, a large task for everyone down there to work and see where we are in, in it. And the governor, the federal government has to step, step up and help. Clearly you need money from the federal government. What about borrowing? Are you, you're gonna have to borrow some of that? It's a possibility. What about uh, making pension payments? I mean, we know what happened for years and years and years when the state skipped pension payments. Might you have to short a pension payment? I don't think so. You don't think that that's no, gonna happen? I do not. And uh, so um, do you honestly think there will be a budget then approved by a majority by the end I of May? I think there's a good chance that there will be, yes. How much money do you need from the feds? Well, right now, this fiscal year, we're looking at a 3 to $4 billion deficit. And in 2021 budget, we're looking at probably a 7 to $8 billion deficit. Mm -hmm. um, so do the math. Do the so, math. All right. Yeah. State Senator Patrick Joyce, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And Brandis, we will wrap it up from here at the Majestic Building in downtown Kankakee in just a bit, but we toss it back to you. Yeah, Paris, all eyes on Springfield next week. Thank you. Up next, local book lovers share their top picks for some quarantine reading. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part through the generous support of the Julius Frankel Foundation. With the stay-at-home order in place until at least the end of the month, many people are finding themselves wanting to pick up new hobbies or maybe new books. 
Joining us with some of their quarantine reading suggestions are Danielle Mullen, owner of the bookstore Semicolon, Marianne Mohanraj, a clinical associate professor of English at the University of Illinois at Chicago and a board member of the Oak Park Public Library. Her new cookbook, A Feast of Serendib, Recipes from Sri Lanka, is now out. And Al Jeannie, professor emeritus of business ethics at Loyola University, Chicago, and author of The Importance of Being Funny. Welcome all of you to Chicago tonight. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for asking us. Happy to be here. So, Al Jeannie, let's start with you, please. What qualities do you find make a book good for quarantine reading? Well, you know, we've got this long period of time in front of us, and I think now's the time to bracket every day so you can read and to pick up the books you otherwise wouldn't pick up because they're too heavy, because you'll never get through it, because they're too ponderous or you think. And now you have the opportunity to go through them. And the, one of the first books I picked up was Spl uh, The Splendid and the Vile uh, by Eric Larson. Um, and this is the chapter wrote the devil uh, and the white city and it's 500 plus pages and it's about the first 57 days of the blitz in london now this book has a lot to offer us because we're going through a blitz right now called uh, coded 19 but and we think we're going through hard times but imagine 57 days of constant bombing in london 45,000 people killed about a third of them children and a nation that refuses to die, and Churchill is the man that leads them through it. This is spellbinding, little, little details, not always the big facts. We know the big facts. We won World War II, but how they made their decisions, how they went through it, little things like Lord Beaverbrook is put in charge of the air, uh, airplane manufacturing, and he sends out teams all over England to pick up the crashed planes, the British planes and the, and the, uh, the German planes, because they need parts. And they have to keep putting these planes up with bailing wire and putting 19 year olds into the planes to go up there after uh, perhaps the most dominant uh, and air one force of the, one in the One of the lessons the I'm sure of that book is probably that we're going to get through it, which a lot of we're folks are saying we're going to get through this as well. Um, Mary Ann, you said uh, that a book that feels appropriate for the moment is Tinder at the Bone by Ruth Reichel. Why is that? So, you know, I think a lot of people right now are looking, if you're, if you're in a situation where you are maybe sheltering in place, you're not an essential worker, you have some time and you're thinking, I'd love to develop a passion, something that I might learn how to do better. Um, so I've been turning a lot to food blogs, food memoirs, and Tender at the Bone is written by the New York Times restaurant critic. Um, but it's speaking about uh, her youth growing up learning how to cook, um, and it's interwoven with a really beautiful family memoir of her mother's disastrous cooking, which you, at <laughs> first it seems, well, at first it seems like she's mocking her mother, and then you realize her mother is manic depressive, and that, uh, so this child was trying to cope with um, these, these massive inedible dinner parties growing up, um, and so that, I don't know, Reichel does a, just a terrific job, I think, of with this um, gentle humor and uh, a passion for food, like the passion for food and comes a lot of folks through. Are, a lot of folks are getting into the kitchen right now um, because, well, you gotta eat, of course, and we can't go out to eat, um, which means a lot of folks are also going to the grocery store. Danielle, one of your top picks is Supermarket by Bobby Hall, who's also Logic the Rapper. Why that book? I like supermarket because it's funny. Um, I like <laughs> anything that shows that humans are naturally multifaceted um, because we are. And Bobby, um, Bobby Hall, who's logic, he's a rapper um, who wrote a book. And it's actually a surprisingly good book. And it is a book within a book that is pretty much within a book. Um, and you'll understand more of that if you were to read it. But that's pretty much it's a guy who's kind of down on his luck and he starts working out at this supermarket but of course he's going to be a great writer um and he begins writing about working at the supermarket and then things start happening and you realize that he's kind of writing himself into the book or however that works but it's <laughs> uh danielle you're also a bookstore owner um how have you and your business been holding up during the stay-at-home order
Uh oh, Danielle, looks like we lost your mic for a second. We're, hopefully, we we'll are. be able to. Back. There okay, you are. Yes. How is your we business doing? We are getting a ton of support simply for existing. Um, and I love that and I appreciate that. I think everybody, we were talking about it a little bit earlier, but everybody understands that bookstores are kind of struggling right now. And so they're going above and beyond to support directly, and we appreciate it. Awesome. Um, so, Al, the next book, I'm going to add this one to my own list. The Confession by Joe Spain grabbed your attention with the very first sentence. Can oh, you read us that sentence? This, there's a history to this, though. <laughs> um, for years, Phil would always ask me, well, how do you decide about reading a book or when do you stop reading a book? And uh, years ago, when I was a little younger and more vigorous, I said, well, I never put a book down. And then it went to about 150 pages. And then it went to 50 pages. I think the last time I talked to Phil, it was 25 pages if I'm not engaged. But here's a reason for reading a book that's going to capture you because it's the first two lines and it's from Joe Spain's The Confession. It's the first spray of my husband's blood hitting the television screen that will haunt me in the weeks to come. A perfect diagonal splash, each droplet descending like a vivid red tear. And that is the sound that I hear in the background of his skull cracking as the blows from the golf club keep raining down. Now, this book didn't turn out to be bad. It turned out to be wonderful. But even if it was bad, that first two lines <laughs> made it worth reading. All right. And so don't 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 tell them anymore, Al. They got to they no, no, go read the no, book. No, no, I don't they, want to ruin it. If they want to know. Just stay Marianne, I want to come back to you. So you sit on the board for the Oak Park Public Library. What kind of changes has the Oak Park Library had to make, especially since uh, Oak Park was the first Illinois town to issue a shelter in place order? Um, well, I think we our library staff really quickly pivoted to offering as many services as they could online. And I'm, I'm personally really proud of them. I think they've taken this uh, need to support the community to heart. They are creating new virtual content every day. They, for example, they're, they're putting out something new for parents of small children to watch every single day to engage with the kids and help keep them occupied and entertained. Um, we've suspended, I think the when people realize they couldn't get their books in person anymore, we've started doing a, a lot of effort to educate people about how to use digital services, which many of them maybe have never tried a Kindle or even watching, reading a book on their laptop before or an audiobook. And uh, we were seeing a huge, you know, just looking at the numbers, there's been a huge influx of people using digital services who hadn't before, which I think is great, actually. Um, it's going to get access to a much broader part of the population. And so and I hope, hope they continue afterwards. Yeah, one of the other books that you recommended, it's called The Lesson by uh, Cadwell Turnbull. Sounds exciting, but terrifying. What's it about? <laughs> I, I think that's a fair, a fair description. It was uh, an alien ship comes to, the, comes to Earth and comes to the US Virgin Islands and they make a deal that they're going to give people the planet, all kinds of wonderful technology in exchange for getting to occupy the U.S. Virgin Islands. And so the people there have to live with these aliens who are very strong and really quite brutal. And the book is, is clearly, it's exploring the history of colonization and slavery. It's not an easy read. It reminds me very much of Octavia Butler. Um, and the prose is beautiful. It was um, long listed for all kinds of awards publishers weekly best book of 2019 library journal kirkus reviews and i, I met this young man uh, at a convention and he just was super impressive and i'm really it was a stunning debut i'm really looking forward to seeing what else he does and, and danielle we've got just a few seconds to fit in a whole book but your other suggestion it's a satire called the sellout by paul Beatty. what's it about the sellout is so funny um it's satirical obviously but it is about a black guy who brings back slavery um, in modern day <laughs> time and gets charged um, and has to go before the Supreme Court because he brought back slavery um, and how it made sense to him and how it was expected to work. And it's really um, a study on what post-racial America looks like um, and how it's satirical, that entire uh, idea is satirical. And he, and he manages to make that funny. Okay, so I'll have to add that to my list as well. <laughs> my thanks to Danielle Mullen, Marianne Mohanraj, and Al Jeannie. And also, um, it, you can head to our website to find more suggestions from our guests and excerpts to those books. Thanks again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Chicago's brick buildings put on a refined face for the street side. But if you peek past the facade, 
you'll find that what's holding them up is a little bit rougher. Jeffrey Baer is here to tell us how the brick that's made of Chicago also built Chicago in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. Hey, Jeffrey. Hi, Brandis. So the question is, it's from Lloyd Fry in Chicago. My wife and I are fans of the HGTV show Hometown, which focuses on a couple updating and remodeling homes in Laurel, Mississippi. They refer to Chicago brick in many episodes of the show. What is Chicago brick and what is its origin and history? Shout out to my home state of Mississippi. Uh, Jeffrey, first, um, I think you're giving new meaning to the word shelter in place. Where are you? Uh, I am. I'm in my own basement of my house uh, in Evanston. The house was built in 1904. And the reason I'm down here is because the foundation is made of the very thing our caller is asking about, um, Chicago brick, or, or more correctly called Chicago common brick. Um, it's perfect that this is the indigenous brick of Chicago because it truly is the Grabowski of building materials and Chicago is famous for it. Um, as you can see, these are not the refined red bricks from St. Louis or the smooth cream colored bricks that come from Milwaukee. That's, those are, are called face brick. Um, our common bricks are like Chicago itself, rough around the edges and full of character, imperfections and diversity. Um, that, and that's because of the clay beneath our feet. Um, it was deposited um, uh, around the shore of Lake Michigan and actually well inland by the last glaciers when they receded about 10,000 years ago. It's, it's called blue clay and it's fairly close to the surface so it's easy to mine. Um, it's high in lime and iron and it's littered with pebbles and other glacial debris so that when the bricks are fired in a kiln um, they turn um, a variety of colors from sort of dusky yellow to pale pink and they're speckled with all those little bits and pieces um, embedded in the clay. By comparison, um, the clay under St. Louis is much smoother and it's high in iron oxide. So it turns a beautiful uniform red color when it's fired in a kiln. Not gonna lie, Jeffrey, I had to Google Grabowski, but moving on. I see red <laughs> and yellow brick buildings all around Chicago though. Oh, well, well, right. But if you look closely, that lovely face brick, which is imported here from other places, is only on the front of typical Chicago buildings. The common brick is used on the sides and the rear facades and internally for like at my house, foundations, chimney flues, structural walls. Um, that's because it was much cheaper and easily available, which made it attractive to builders from far beyond Chicago. Chicago brick cost about, back in the day, cost about five to $10 per thousand bricks compared, compared to as much as $35 per thousand for face brick. This is according to the person I consider to be Chicago's foremost brick expert, Will Quam, who operates the uh, website Brick of Chicago and gives brick tours. Uh, he was a, a real key to answering this question. You might remember we featured him on Chicago Tonight last year when he showed us St. Stanislaus Kostka Church from 1881 in Pulaski Park, which, as you can see, was built entirely from Chicago common brick, even on the facade. And that was done to save construction costs. And Jeffrey, how did Chicago become a brick boomtown? Well, we started making bricks uh, here in Chicago as early as the 1840s, but it really took off after the Chicago fire of 1871, when new building codes made it all but impossible to rebuild out of wood. Um, in one year alone, 1910, we produced nearly a billion of these, quote, humble cubes of clay, as one writer lovingly described them that year. Um, at one time, there were clay pits and brickyards all over Chicago and in suburbs like Blue Island and Park Ridge. Uh, Park Ridge even was originally called Brickton. Um, I am holding an original Brickton brick. So this is sort of a pinkish Chicago common brick. I was given this by the Chicago, excuse me, the Park Ridge um, Historical Society. Um, the community dropped the name and, and renamed itself Park Ridge um, after all the clay was mined out by uh, 1873. Um, the last Chicago brickyard closed in uh, as recently as 1981. Yeah, but Newark gets to be called Brick City. Go figure. Um, Jeffrey, oh. why, <laughs> why don't we make, why doesn't Chicago make brick anymore? Well, newer building techniques, including steel and concrete block are just cheaper for structural 
purposes. Um, and it, you know, it's very labor intensive to lay bricks. Um, also old brick making operations couldn't comply with modern environmental laws without costly modifications. And um, much of the clay near the surface that was cheap and easy to mine was exhausted. But in recent years, Chicago common brick has surged in popularity here. And if you believe that HGTV show that our caller asked about, um, as far away as Mississippi, um, when old buildings here are torn down, the bricks are salvaged, cleaned, and resold, like those at Bricks Incorporated in Little Village. Um, and they're not just for utilitarian structural purposes anymore. Um, these days, people have come to prize the old bricks for their character, having weathered and mellowed on buildings for decades or even for more than a century. Loft conversions expose the brick in existing buildings and reclaimed brick is often used in new construction like in this modern home in the Bucktown neighborhood. Okay, bricks with character just like the city. Thank you, Jeffrey. My pleasure. And you can find more on this and other Ask Jeffrey questions on our website. And while you're there, be sure to send in your own questions about Chicago to Ask Jeffrey. Up next, whether it's a friend or foe, unexpected facts about the dandelion. Ask Jeffrey is made possible in part by BMO Harris Bank. Wow, you ready? Yeah, let me just grab my wallet. Uh-oh, I've seen this before. Wallet way too big, skinny jeans too skinny. I'll just carry it. Before you break something, you should know you don't actually need a wallet. With BMO Harris, you can just take cash out with your phone. Or if you need to, you can pay them with Zelle. That works? Yeah. You're stuck, aren't you? Smile. Ooh, those jeans are way too tight. That feeling you get when no wallet is no big deal. That's the BMO effect. Lots of folks have had a lot of extra time to admire their yards lately, but not every sign of spring has been greeted with praise. The dandelion, a once prized plant that gardeners used to exhibit at county fairs, now holds the title of public lawn enemy number one. But is that reputation deserved? WTTW News reporter Patty Wetley joins us now with the details. Hey, Patty. Hey, Brenda, it's good to see you. You too. So super important question. What exactly yes. are dandelions? Are they weeds? They are a flower, you know, unless you don't want them and then they're a weed, which actually is pretty much the definition of a weed. Um, it, there's nothing really official that labels something a weed except for the fact that it's a plant that shows up where you don't want it. So if you don't want a dandelion, it's a weed. If you want it, it's a flower. Ah, ta -da. It's, it's what it is what you make it. So what are some exactly. of their relatives since it's a flower? It, you know, once you hear this, it makes so much sense, but they're related to chrysanthemums and daisies and marigolds. They're all in the same family. Um, it's, they're part of a huge family, actually, that also includes lettuce and artichokes, um, which explains why one of the benefits of the dandelion is that it's edible. Um, so you'll see its leaves show up in fancy salads uh, and things like that. Um, and it also was traditionally used for medicines. So it has a lot of different applications aside from us just not wanting it in our yards. And for centuries, it was really highly respected. I, I mean, I've also heard of dandelion tea. What else are dandelions used <laughs> yes. for? You know, it can also be used to make wine. It had enough uses that um, it was actually purposefully brought over here from Europe. When the early European colonists first came to North America, they made sure to bring the dandelion with them because it was important enough that it was something that they wanted to bring from the old world to the new world. Um, so it's not something like the zebra mussel that hitched a ride unbeknownst to people. It was brought here for a reason. And before I let you go, what role do they play for pollinators? They're super important because this time of year, a lot of people know in Chicago, there's not a whole lot of stuff blooming. It's too cold, it's, it's too wet. Um, a lot of plants won't show up until summer. So bees and a lot of butterflies especially really need the dandelion as a food source. So they're a super important early spring food source for butterflies and bees. Awesome, thank you so much, Patty Wetley. Always good to talk to you. Thanks, Brandis. And you can read Patty's full story on our website. It's a good one, totally worth it, as they all are. That's at wttw.com news. 
And Paris joins us again from Kankakee, Illinois, but he's been reporting from all over the Chicago area this past week. Uh, Paris, what are some of your takeaways from the week? I want to say a bit about the long-term care facilities, and I think this is coming into view all across the nation. These outbreaks at some of these places are really terrible. We mentioned the one earlier tonight in Kankakee, 116 cases at this developmental uh, facility uh, called Shapiro. There's a veterans home in Mantino at the north end of this county reporting about 50 cases there. Belmont Cragen, there was a, an outbreak, uh, Cicero, and you know, when you saw some of these places in those neighborhoods, they didn't look like the most inviting places. So I think, you know, and, and if you look at other cases, because the state keeps a tally of all the long-term care facilities, there's places with zero cases. So it raises questions about the management of some of these places. So now, Brandis, I'm gonna throw it back on to you. What sticks out to you from this week? Yeah, Paris, you know, I talked to folks in a bunch of different, you know, pieces. They all reflect a different part uh, or a different piece of the pie. You know, one of them is restaurants. We spoke with Chef Rick Bayless uh, about the work that he and other chefs are doing um, to get more money, to get more funding for those restaurants, but also how they're helping each other out. Um, and, and I also spoke with, um, you know, some hospitals and uh, about their supply chain. They're not all on the edge. Some of them might be pushing it, but you know, you have to take the positivity where you can get it. The governor says we're on track to open uh, to phase three at the end of the month. So I'll take a little bit of hope when I can. That is our show, though, for this Thursday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. And you can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night for the Week in Review. That's right. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. I'm Paris Schutz. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you tomorrow back up in Chicago. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm, proud to be named in the 2020 edition of the Best Lawyers in America.